My name's Dominique Shaw, I'm one half of Yorkless Studios, and I'd just like to thank the Photography Show and Fujifilm for inviting me to talk to you today. So if you've never seen my work before, I'm pretty much a documentary style photographer. I mostly shoot weddings, but I also do a lot of family work and in my spare time travel around the world shooting street photography, which is kind of how I practice and hone my technique ready for shooting my professional work. And street photography has really been quite a big influence on my work over the years. Going into what is very much a blank canvas when there is no set subject as such, so there's nothing to shoot, and yet everything to shoot, made me think about things in a slightly different way and change certain aspects of how I approach documentary photography in a wedding and my family work. It made me think a lot more about how to really try to show personality in photographs, how to find humour or individual quirks to not just show what was happening, but a little bit about who the person in front of you really is. Because people have always been the thing I found most fascinating to photograph. And when I take someone's picture, my ultimate goal is to be able to look at that photograph and somehow relate to the person or people in the frame, to understand a little aspect of their personality, even if I don't know them. And if we can find a way to photograph strangers in such a way that the viewer can in some small way understand and relate to them, then just imagine how much we're going to connect to a photograph of somebody we already know. So whilst I apply all of those ideas to all of my work, both professional and personal, I don't think there's anywhere more powerful to really try and show personality in an image than in family photography. If you think about those big old family albums we all put together, when you or your family member pull them all out from under the bed, flip through them, you'll probably find a lot of pictures of you or your parents and siblings, maybe standing and smiling in front of landmarks around the world, or maybe posing for a group shot on someone's birthday, or standing around the table whilst the birthday girl blows up the candles. Or these days, maybe the odd selfie has started to creep in, that sort of thing. Those are certainly the sort of images that my parents' family albums are absolutely filled with. And I guess you'd say that's probably the kind of traditional way of capturing important family memories. Now I've got to say that all of these shots are important. Now as I say, my own family albums are full of them. And I love looking through these images and seeing the places we've been, seeing how the family have changed over the years and the houses we used to live in. The sh these shots, that, well, they have a rightful place in every family album and we should all continue to take them. But most of the time, that kind of photograph is about stopping the action and spining nicely for the camera, which kind of captures the literal story of what was happening, i.e. we all went to Disney World. But it often strips out a lot of the fun and personality of the moment. Now, when you ask everyone to freeze, look at the camera and smile, you're effectively trying to remember a moment that was important to you by stopping that moment from playing out. You're asking someone who might have been smiling naturally before you intervened to stop what they're doing and then smile again on cue. So alongside these posed family shots, we want to try to get some really beautiful natural shots as well. Because if we capture the spontaneity of the moment, actually it's actually happening and really see the genuine smiles, laughter, even a few tears if you've got children around, and all those amazing family dynamics, then we can create more of a record of who you guys all were at this point in your life. Particularly at a time like Christmas, when if yours are anything like my Christmases, there's usually chaos going on around you. So today I'm gonna to take you through a few little hints and tips on how to embrace the madness 
look for personality and try and get a little bit more creative with some candid family shots over Christmas. Now, if there's anything you want to ask me about, I'll be going live at the end of this session to answer any queries you want to throw at me. So do post any questions in the comments and we'll round all of those up and address them at the end. So let's talk about family shots and how we can make sure we're creating an extra special collection of personal images this year. So the first and probably the most important tip I'm going to give you is to always focus on photographing the people, not the event. I've been a wedding photographer for more than 15 years now and I absolutely love it. But the reason it interests me is not the wedding itself, it's the people. The wedding just provides me the license to photograph them. So I'm interested less in the formal activities of the wedding, i.e. in this case the speeches, and more in the effect of the activity taking place on the people around me. And it's the same with anything I shoot. If I'm doing street photography and there's an event going on, I usually have my back to it. I'm not interested in the event. Um, in this case, there was a Formula One demo going on behind me. I'm interested in the way that the people around me react to it. And so if there's a family Christmas, or in this case, birthday dinner going on, I'm not actually particularly looking for the action shot of someone blowing out a candle. I'm looking for the moments before and after. The moments where I can see the relationships between the family members, where the activity has made people connect and interact, and I get to understand a little bit more about the family dynamic. As someone who photographs other people's families regularly, I find it incredibly freeing to photograph my own, because when I'm capturing images that are just for me, I have more freedom to capture one or two photographs that are maybe not going to have quite as much instant appeal at this moment in time as they're going to have in the future. Now, one of the reasons that photographers often find it harder to photograph their local area than to photograph, say, another country or a different culture is that when you're used to seeing something every day, nothing really seems that interesting or out of the ordinary. The architecture seems mundane. The cars that you're driving around are just the models you're used to seeing. The clothes everyone's wearing are mostly more or less the same sort of style that you see and probably wear yourself every day. But in 20 or 30 years time, everything is likely to look very different. You yourself will have changed in appearance, and so will your home, your car, the activities you do, the computer games the kids are playing. Family photographs are a book of memories, and all these details that seem pretty mundane right now are going to get way more interesting as you get older. And they're not just going to be interesting to you. Photo albums are precious family heirlooms. Imagine how the next generation who've never known these fashions will see them. So when you're shooting family photographs, try to think like that you're like an alien and you've never seen this environment before. Because in the future, that's almost how it's gonna feel to look at some of these photographs. You still wanna try and make a photograph that's interesting to you look at right now, but it's sometimes useful to have kind of one eye on how future you will see these images and take photographs as if everything you see is brand new to you. Now with documentary style work, there's often a temptation to think that everyone needs to be actively doing something to make an interesting picture. But again, it's not about the activity itself. It's about the way that people react to it. Sometimes a very simple, subtle expression or tiny movement can be just as powerful as a big one. So for instance, if the kids are running around wildly, then of course, make sure you photograph them. But if say one child is a little bit separate and generally doesn't join in with the others, then don't try to force her into an activity. Photograph her in the environment she's comfortable in because that's part of who she is. We're all different. Some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts. And as a photographer, you need to be able to empathize with both. It's often the quieter member of the party whose body language tells the biggest story. And if you take the time to read and try to understand them, you can sometimes capture just the right expression to some of how that person feels about what's going on. So photograph everyone and try to really embrace who they are. If someone's not smiling, that's not a reason not to take a photograph. It just might mean that you have to work a little bit harder to find the beauty of the moment. Photographing people is all about empathy and understanding, and no one knows your family better than you do. So use that to your advantage. I think it's always quite natural to want to showcase a perfect Christmas and perfect family, but often it's the imperfections that are really the most interesting and memorable. Think about it. If I asked you to give me one of your childhood Christmas memories, what springs to mind first? 
the nice smart clothes you're wearing or the ridiculous over the top tacky jumper that your uncle turned up in? Do you talk about how the table settings looked really beautiful that year? Or do you laugh about the time when dad burnt the turkey? It's so often the things that make us laugh that really stick in our memories. And whilst everyone's memories of Christmas will be different, laughter is a shared experience, a shared memory. And that means that when you're gonna be reminded of it, it's gonna spark more conversations, more collective laughter. And to me, that's what I love the family photographs that I take to do. Family photographs are not there to impress anyone. The pictures are for you and the other people in the frame. So there's no point trying to pretend to be something that you're not because who are you trying to fool? Life as a family is rarely completely perfect. Things happen. Stuff doesn't always go to plan. Kids cry, everyone falls asleep. A set of perfect photographs will invariably feel somewhat false. So embrace the imperfections. Now don't get me wrong, I don't believe in creating photographs that are unflattering to anyone or that take the mickey out of any individual. But to me, the, the joke should always be on the situation, not the person. But not every photograph has to be pretty. It's great to capture a rawness in the photographs, try and find humor in the imperfections, and show some of the moments that went wrong, as well as the ones that went right. But don't point the finger at anyone. Now this is a shot of double imperfections from one of my own family's gatherings. And I don't need to see any more than those mismatched stocks to know exactly who's responsible, and neither would anyone else in the family. But with this shot, I'm not trying to embarrass him. I just, I don't need to see that he's gutted, he's just knocked something over. And in fact, from this frame, we don't even know for sure it was him. If we included his face, we'd be removing ambiguity and directly assigning blame. But the humor of the moment would be gone. But seeing those socks, so reflective of his personality, surrounded by the chaos he's presumably caused, reminds me fondly of him and makes me smile every time. And those mismatched socks actually lead me on to another good tip. Look for the small details. We don't always need to see someone's expression to understand their emotion or their connection between people. Sometimes the tiniest interaction can tell you everything about the way people feel about each other. These little everyday interactions are the kind of moments that can easily go almost unnoticed when, when they actually take place because they're almost not visual memories at all, they're feelings. But photographing something inherently gives power to it. It points out that this is significant. And when you look at the photograph, hopefully you feel something unspoken about that relationship. Or sometimes we don't even need to see a physical interaction in order to understand something about a relationship. Something as simple as a little heart on a pancake tells us about the kind of person who went to the effort of doing that. It shows that they care about whoever it is they're giving it to. And by just including the hands, we also know a little bit about who it was that received it. It's a tiny little forgotten gesture. But again, by photographing it and choosing to preserve it, we're going to give it added significance. And the earlier tip about looking at the world as if you're an alien doesn't just apply to capturing current fashions. If you think of everything around you as potentially interesting, then you start to notice little oddities in reality that again, by pointing out in a photograph can make an interesting image. For example, this could just be a photograph of a young child going to sleep, which might not necessarily be that interesting on its own. But by noticing that his body position mimics that of the monkey on the blanket next to him, we can carefully frame the image to maximize the similarities and make a slightly humorous image from something very simple. Or in this case, the kids are just staring at a screen as they often are, which wouldn't really be a very exciting image. But by monitoring the whole environment and watching what's going on with the TV behind them as well, I was able to wait for this moment where it feels like the character on the TV is interacting with them and looking at whatever's on their screen as well. And here's another example of that kind of idea. This time, all we have to look at is the back of the kid's head. But by just putting yourself in a position to take the photograph and having a little patience, you can sometimes find a symmetry or connection that seems to tie these two worlds together. I really enjoy taking these kind of photographs because they're not big moments that everyone can see taking place. We're not just photographing existing memory that everyone will already have in the back of their minds. And the photograph is just a reminder to spark the memory. These kind of photographs are very much about making images, not just taking them. They're our own unique observations and they show our own personality and sense of humor from behind the lens. And ultimately, all of these little details can help to turn something really tiny into something much bigger, a much bigger portrait of real family life. The best documentary shots are often bursting with spontaneity and no one is more spontaneous than a child, except maybe an animal. 
Following what the kids and pets are up to is guaranteed to reveal some hilarious moments. And if you want to liven up a slightly lifeless scene, then layering it up, including the kids or pets' reactions to what's going on, can take a photograph to another level. But again, remember that it's not always necessarily about the kids making big movements and doing crazy things, or the animals for that matter. Don't forget to keep looking for those tiny details. Sometimes a simple facial expression is all you need. Whether that's just getting a close-up of a look of an utmost cheekiness, or a role reversal where the adult is the active one, and the child couldn't be less interested. Because moments like that, where granddad's trying so hard to no avail, are the reality of family life. And to me, those moments are always the most telling and the most interesting. They're always going to bring a smile to my face. And again, don't forget that stillness can tell its own story. Our family dog Paddington, fast asleep next to my nephew's numerous toys, scattered haphazardly across the room, and his penguin friend, seemingly equally exhausted, tells you everything you need to know about how that day is going, without ever seeing the overexcited child in question in the photograph. Often, the best documentary scenes happen at the least expected moments. You can have a whole day planned out going to the park or playing a game or unwrapping the presents around the tree. But so often the best image comes between all of those planned events. Maybe taking the kids to bed will provide the most beautiful frame. Perhaps everyone was sleeping after Christmas dinner and someone fell off the sofa. The nature of shooting documentary style is that it's impossible to map out in advance. So keep the camera with you and keep looking out for those unexpected beats, even when they seem unlikely to occur. One of the drawbacks of winter, photography-wise, is that we're of course going to have fewer hours of light and potentially, generally, darker conditions with the not-so-great weather. But the light in winter can actually be some of the most unusual and therefore magical, and Christmas itself provides even more unusual lighting that we can take advantage of. Now personally, I never use flash in my work, no matter what the conditions, so I'm always looking to utilise the available light to capture the raw feel of the scene. Christmas lights provide opportunities like the shot, where the subject is literally playing with the light source, giving us a lovely soft glow on his face. But just being in a room with fairy lights is going to add different colours, and more importantly, a different feel to the images. And if we can get some of those lights into the background of the image, then we can drop to a shallow depth of field, in this case, f1.3, and add in some of that lovely, soft, out-of-focus light bokeh as well to add an extra sparkle to the image. Or we can also flip that idea on its head and bring the bokeh into the foreground to make it more of a direct compositional element. Now to do that, we're going to have to have the lights in the foreground and shoot right through them, again at a very shallow depth of field, this time f1.0. So you end up with these lovely balls of light framing the subject. It's also a useful technique if you don't have a particularly clean view around the person, or in our case tortoise you're trying to photograph, as the light will block them out and focus us on the key subject. But when it's not quite such a dark winter's day, it's definitely an opportunity to get outside with the camera, because on the right day, the light in winter is extraordinary. Particularly if you get lucky with snow on the ground, or even just a nice frost reflecting light back up at you. You're going to end up with a slightly crispier, cooler light than you find in summer, and I would definitely embrace that colder look to give the instant feel of winter. And when the sun does come out, particularly on a snowy day, it can be a great idea to shoot into the light. If you can catch it right at a shallow aperture, the snow refracts the light and gives you multi-layered bokeh, both in front and behind your subject, creating such a stunning look. Snow or not though, don't forget that if you've got some bold sunshine, usually in winter the morning is best for this, then that crisp quality provides opportunities to play around with light and shadows, both outside and inside. Light is not just a means to make scenes look soft and pretty, by playing with harsh light it can be a compositional element in itself and give it a really interesting look. So whereas in most of the images we've looked at here, we've been looking to isolate the subject and have some beautiful blurred soft light in the background, for this image on the stairs, we're looking to match the harsh light with a sharper look and give the light on the stairs is just as much focus as the girl. So here I'm shooting at f8 to keep everything sharp and exposing for the highlights so we can get these nice deep shadows and lovely crisp lines of light. Whilst we all dream of that golden light and beautiful untouched white Christmas snow, the reality is that in winter the weather isn't always going to be your friend. But you should never let the weather put you off getting great photographs. So much of photography is about your own mindset. If you don't believe you're going to find a photograph, then you never will. So try and think of the weather as much as a character of the day, and don't be afraid of it. Use it. If it's cold, 
then what's everyone wearing? What's their body language like? How are they dealing with the cold? Hats, hoods, umbrellas can actually add to the scene and make it more interesting. And again, if we pay attention to these details, like in this case, a pair of eyes on a woolly hat, then we can play with the angles, hide the face and add an unexpected element to an already interesting moment. One of the easiest traps to fall into when shooting natural unposed moments is just to be purely reactionary. You see something interesting happening and you quickly fire off a shot. Now that might succeed in capturing whatever happened in that moment, but unless you get extraordinarily lucky, you're unlikely to photograph a great photograph that way. Every bit as much active thought needs to go into capturing a documentary moment as a posed one. And if we can do that, then we can capture natural photographs that deserve a place framed on the wall, just as much as any stop and smile shot that might normally take that place. Now, when you think about taking a posed group shot of everyone, you don't generally just tell everyone to stand in a position and fire off a shot, come what may. You usually find a nice background, think about how the light is hitting people, try and find a nice balance to how people are standing and move the camera around to try and get everyone nicely framed and looking good. All of those same thoughts are going into my head when I take a documentary picture. I'm just gonna move myself rather than the people in the picture to make all that happen. So when, for example, my nephew is playing in the park with some other kids, like in this picture, I'm not just following what he's doing at all times, I'm actively looking at the background and my surroundings to find out what might make the most interesting composition. And in this case, using a wooden fort to frame him in the middle and show that he's playing with this little girl. Now in this kind of situation though, it's not a girl that we know, so I'm going to try not to show her face. Both because it's a child, but also because I know as she's in the foreground, the viewer's eyes will immediately be drawn to her, rather than the real subject of the picture if we see her face particularly because her bright colored coat is catching the light, so she's already quite prominent. But because my nephew is actually double framed in this shot, both by the foreground part of the fort and then the little castle gate in the background, and because it's his face that is showing and he has a little bit of light on him as well, those double frames are actually drawing a lot of attention back to him, helping us to rebalance the image. Finding a physical frame to put around the subjects can actually be a really useful trick to make certain parts of an image stand out. For example, here's another shot from that same park where we've actually got quite close and used the play structure to split the frame in two, using the left side to provide a little context, and again I frame my nephew on the right to draw your attention straight to him. Or in this image, he's now playing on the wooden train, but there are other people around the park. Now just because he's the main subject of the image doesn't mean that we can ignore the other people, they need to be balanced in the image too. So here I've actually framed the girl on the swing using a view through the wooden hut and making sure she's right in the center so it's nice and clean. I've also positioned the camera so that the other two people are nicely spread out and so they're not overlapping or any kind of distracting elements in the photograph and adjusted the height of the camera so that my nephew is surrounded by space and nothing else is too close to him. So whether it's using a physical frame or just how we use negative space around the people, we need to be thinking constantly about the positioning of all the elements around us how the light is going to draw attention to certain elements, the way that we want to draw attention to a certain person or people. It's never just a point and click. We need to stay totally switched on at all times and be ready for something to happen by already having thought about those other elements. So one of the best tips I can probably give you is to get close. Family is a tight relationship. And if you wanna capture the raw feel of it and all the inside humor, you can't be watching it from the outside. When we look at the pictures afterwards, we need to feel like we're part of the action at the center of it all. We want you to be taken instantly back to that moment in time. Like a lot of people will just use a zoom lens to get them close to the scene. But I think you can always feel that distance when you do that. So personally for me, the best way is to physically move your feet and get closer. And whilst the better you get at this style, the more you're able to play with distance from the subject, a good starting point is to think of it being like no more than a handshake distance away. The good news is that unlike when doing street photography, when you're shooting your own family, it's hopefully gonna be much easier to get that close without anyone getting uncomfortable. And in fact, getting used to doing that with family first is a really good way to practice that skill of getting closer, ready to take it to slightly less familiar environments. And there's a few things you can do to aid that and help everyone to get more comfortable around the camera. Start off the session with maybe a physically smaller lens. That can be less intimidating and help people get used to mostly ignoring the camera. Physically getting down to the same level of the kids also helps you to put them on kind of on the same status as you and help them to relax around you. 
And whoever you're photographing though, there's always a slightly awkward moment when you first bring the camera out and people don't quite know how to react. So I think the best way to combat that is to just to go for it straight away, keep shooting, take a lot of frames so that everyone has a chance to get used to it. If they're looking a little uncomfortable at first, that's okay. Not every photograph needs to end up printed on the living room wall. Sometimes taking a photograph early on is just the means to get a better photograph later when everyone's got used to you. Of course, one side effect of getting a little closer to the subject is that you're more likely to get a little bit of direct interaction with people looking directly into the camera. One of the old kind of tropes of documentary photography is that you should be almost invisible, a fly on the wall that no one should ever acknowledge. But personally, I think that sometimes those unspoken interactions reveal the most about the person into whose eyes we're looking. We are not invisible. We will inevitably sometimes slightly alter people's behavior by our presence. So let's use that to our advantage rather than pretend we're not there. If I'm shooting documentary, I'm never gonna ask anyone to look at the camera, but I'm gonna use my body language to try and be as disarming and feel as much of a friend to them as I can. So if they do look at the camera, they're giving me something with their eyes. In this shot, for example, I love that the adults and even the dog are ignoring me while the kids almost share a joke with me. They're direct to camera expressions and the juxtaposition with the other people and animals in the frame add a little humor and end up really making the image. Or a more radical example, this shot is purely about the eye contact and the humor of that. Without it there, really, there isn't an image here at all. The thing about not directing people is that whilst I find that they constantly create spontaneous moments that are more powerful than I could ever hope to artificially stage, getting everyone to line up perfectly in each photograph is, in theory at least, naturally going to be harder than if we just told people exactly where to stand and what to do. Unless, of course, you're dealing with trying to get a bored child to stand still. But just like as if we're stopping everyone to smile at the camera, we want to make sure that everyone looks good in the photograph, that they're not pulling the wrong kind of expression and that their eyes are open assuming that's relevant to that particular frame. And however skilled you are, when people are moving a lot and you're not controlling the scene, it's extremely difficult to absolutely nail that with just a single click of the shutter. Thankfully, we live in the age of the delete button. Well, wasting a shot doesn't cost you a roll of film, so don't be afraid to take three or four shots at the same moment to find the best one. Often the teeniest micro movement of the subject can make a world of difference to the success of the image whether that's just finding the absolute best version of that facial expression or waiting for that arm to fall in the exact right position to frame someone behind them. There are a lot of moving parts to a documentary image, particularly when shooting wider with more elements in the frame. So there's absolutely no shame in occasionally switching to burst mode, as long as you're actively working through a composition and not just absentmindedly hoping for the best. But even when you think you've got the best version of that composition, it's super important not to switch off. A good mantra to have is that there's always a better photograph. You might have captured your original idea, but when you're working with spontaneous action, something unpredictable could happen at any time that might make it even better than you expected. So stick with the moment and see it through until it's finished. If you've nailed one composition, don't try and congratulate yourself. Try a different position, recompose and see if a better shot presents itself. And whilst you're shooting through a scene, you want to try and give yourself different options. And one of the ways to do that is to make adjustments to the height the camera is shooting from. Switching up the angles you're shooting from is a good way to keep the images feeling fresh. And a good tip to help keep that constantly in your mind and keep yourself from always just shooting from the same perspective is to think about trying to hide your height from the viewer. The height you take a photograph from can change the feeling of it completely. In this shot, we're right down on the ground looking up so that we're seeing it almost from Paddington's perspective. By doing that and seeing the world from a dog's eye view, we immediately create a connection with him and feel more empathy towards him and how he's feeling after playing with a child all day. Or sometimes it can be interesting to get high and shoot down to give an entirely different perspective or highlight a particular element in the frame. In this case, the drawing of Snoopy. Shooting down like this also changes our status and the viewpoint of the image. Now, looking down from this angle, for example, maybe it feels like we're taking the place of a parent in the frame, coming to investigate what the kids are up to. Whereas if we were down on the ground with them, we'd just be one of the gang. Getting high can also be a good way to clean up an image and hide anything that maybe is a little bit messy. One of the things I realized from shooting street photography 
was that there's always a natural tendency to, often quite significantly, change the way you're shooting, depending not just on the situation, but actually on the type of camera that you're using. For most of us, it's like a mode switch in our heads. When you pick up a professional level camera, you start to think more about composition and positioning, but when you pick up something like your phone, it's so easy just to forget all that and just point and shoot as we discussed earlier. But the thing about capturing spontaneous family moments is that you never really know when the best ones are gonna happen. So if you're maybe gonna use your phone, and let's face it, it's the camera we always have on us, then you need to try and think of it as being exactly the same tool as that professional level camera. You still need to think about the light, the composition, the moment, just as you would with any other camera. Remember, the shots you store on your phone might be the ones you see even more than those you're hoping to put in the album on the wall. So you wanna try and get great shots on there too. And don't forget to think about whether you want it landscape or portrait. Documentary photographs often require a bit more width and consequently are much more commonly captured in landscape, which of course is the kind of default where you'd hold a normal camera. But we naturally hold our phones upright in a portrait position. So if you're looking to mix and match your photographic memories between phone shots and proper camera shots, then don't forget that you might wanna spin your phone around for at least some of the photographs. Now, I often find that switching to holding my phone in landscape can also help to kind of trigger that particular mode in my head and make me think of it more as a proper camera. And if a bit of a visual clue helps to remind you that your phone is more than just a point and shoot device, there are great apps that simulate the look and dials of classic cameras to help you keep your brain engaged as well as creating some beautiful filmic looks to the end results. But sometimes the best way to ensure you're not going to switch into the wrong mental photographic mode, and of course, to also get the best image quality ready to print for that family album, is just to always have a great camera on you, which is exactly what I like to do. Whether I'm shooting family shots, street photography, or even as part of um, my wedding setup, it doesn't matter. I always have the same camera with me because I'm always trying to approach my photographs in exactly the same way, no matter what I'm shooting. So shooting everything with the same kind of camera just seems to kind of make sense to me. So as I'm going to carry it with me everywhere, I wanted something that was very light and very compact, but still shares the same feel and features of my main wedding cameras. So I'm never having to adapt my style to different devices. So for me, I normally do the bulk of my professional work with Fujifilm X-Pro series cameras. So I chose the Fujifilm X-E4 as my take everywhere camera. In terms of its look, layout and feel, it's kind of a mini version of an X-Pro and takes the same lenses, meaning that the lenses I use for weddings are the same ones I use everywhere else too. I actually also really love the X100V, which we also own, but having the interchangeable lenses on the XE4, I think we can be really valuable, particularly when shooting something like personal family photos, we might have to adapt to a very wide range of scenarios. And at Christmas time, having a couple of different lenses is particularly useful, as while most of the time I like to shoot quite wide and tend to have a lot of things in focus, as we've seen, one of the things that Christmas brings in particular is a lot of fairy lights and shiny decorations that we can get some really beautiful bokeh from. So it's great to have a bit of a tighter portrait style lens that's good at getting a shallow depth of field as well to really make the best out of that. So the two lenses that I personally use for most of my family shots at the moment, and that I'll definitely be using this Christmas, are the Fujifilm XF50 1.0, which gives a really stunning soft bokeh for those close-in shots, or the times when I want to isolate the subject a little bit more, and also the XF18 1.4 which is a fantastic wide lens for capturing all that amazing chaos of Christmas time and including lots of different elements in the scene. And because I like to get so close, it's the wider lenses, whether that be the 18 that I'm using at the moment or often in my professional kind of work, the 23 1.4, that I probably shoot 80 to 90% of my photographs on. The absolute most important thing though when capturing your own family pictures at home is to enjoy the experience. Hopefully you're taking these photographs because you enjoy doing it, but it's important not to let the desire to take great photographs overtake making your own connections with your own families at Christmas. That's important not just from a point of making sure you have a great Christmas yourself, but even from a photographic perspective. One of the reasons that family photographs can be so powerful is because of the person who took it. Your empathy and understanding of the people you're photographing is what's gonna ensure that even though you're behind the camera, you're still in every single photograph. Because with family images in particular, it's your feelings, your emotions, your sense of humor, and your family dynamic that creates these images. So if you're struggling and lacking inspiration, then mix things up a little. Personally, I often like to switch it up and shoot a bunch of family pictures on my Instax instant camera because I just find it a really fun experience. I love taking those photographs straight out of the camera and hanging them up so the Christmas photos become part of the decorations. 
And the lovely thing about that is that when the photographs themselves end up in other pictures, it kind of adds another interesting element to the image. Somehow there's an immediate sense of nostalgia to those instant prints. And nostalgia is really what family Christmas photographs are all about. They're also a great simple camera to be able to quickly pass to someone if you want to make sure you're in somewhere in the photographs yourself. Or if like me, you're lucky enough to have got an early Christmas present in the form of an Instax printer, then you can also get some of that nostalgic feel by just printing all those great photographs you've either taken on your camera or your phone in Instax forms and hang those up instead. Everyone's so used to being photographed from phones all the time that sometimes they're the easiest way to get some images if you're experiencing a little resistance to having a camera around all the time. And the special look that Instax prints have is a great way to tie all of those images together. So whilst I hope you have found all these tips helpful, when it comes to photographs of your own families, there's no better guide than your own instincts and feelings in creating something that's going to be truly meaningful to you and your family, both now and in the future. Nobody knows these people better than you do. Nobody knows the in-jokes, the personality quirks, and the way that Christmas felt with your family more than you. And if you can find a way to portray that feeling of connection to them, then you pretty much can't go wrong. So keep that camera with you. Don't switch off. Keep thinking about your composition and the light around you, but more importantly, really think about what the people in these photographs mean to you and let that guide your choices. And remember, these photographs are for you and nobody else. So most importantly of all, just really have fun with it and have yourself a very Merry Christmas. Hey everyone, thank you all so much for watching along. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed it. I have a few questions that have come in, some through Instagram and, uh, and some through, um, and through the YouTube channel. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, right, I'll start off with something that CT said, which was, uh, if you missed a moment, has it gone? Would you ever try to recreate it and capture a particular image? That's a really good question, CT. Um, so would I ever would I ever want to recreate anything? No, not personally for me. I'm very much about capturing things sponta spontaneously, and spontaneity is what's really kind of a real big draw in all my work, whether it be weddings or street or family, it's all for me about spontaneity. And it's kind of the equivalent of seeing like a, a an animal in the zoo to the wild. <laughs> like for me, I just like there's something just so special about it being real and it by it happening and this, as soon as you start recreating something for me it just kind of loses something so personally i wouldn't recreate it i hope that answered your question cd uh okay so andrew said shoot manual or autofocus i get frustrated um to get quick shots and find the focus elsewhere okay so thank you very much andrew so you get a bit frustrated by so with the focus, essentially. Well, what do I do? I shoot um, autofocus. I very rarely do I use manual, only very occasionally if I was doing something like street and there was a very particular reason. But most, most of the time I use autofocus, but I tend to not use face um, recognition. I tend to use the joystick and I move the focus myself. And um, that way, I, you know, because for me, it may not be the foreground. I may want the background that's the focus or I may want the foreground to be the focus. I want to make the decisions. So for me, I personally always say autofocus, but I take charge of where the focus is going to go. I hope that makes sense, Andrew. If you have any more questions about it, then just let me know. I'm just going to see if there's any more that have come in. Um, OK, do you have any recommendations for including yourself in the photos? Um, do you have any recommendations for including yourself in the photos? That's a good question, actually, because it's um, as I was saying in the video, like it's really important to be part of the part of the day as well. And like, yeah, I mean, for me, um, my brother Liam, he's also a photographer, so <laughs> I could uh, easily give him the camera, um, which would be one way of doing it. Uh, you could also use reflections, um, or um, I love my Instax, um, so I would use a lot of Instax images. And I would, um, I'd probably just pass the Instax camera to any of my member of the family, and then I would get included in them because it's really important, particularly at Christmas, that you're not just, you know, you want to be shown in the photographs themselves, yes, by showing your humour and your personality and who you are, but also you want to physically be in them so that you know everyone can see you. So I'd say like, yeah, make sure that you that you 
pass the camera around, particularly if you've got another photographer, a friend, um, and also with Instax, anyone can use it, anyone can take pictures, and it's just so much fun. And that's what it should be all about, Christmas. It should be all about having fun and taking pictures. Uh, we've got a question here from Mario. Uh, hi, if light indoors is very low and lights are off, what is the maximum ISO you would go and which aperture? Good question. Um, I, I mean, I can go as high as I, you know, the cameras are phenomenal these days. You can go as high as you'd like. However, I personally, just because of the kind of the, the style of how I like my images to look, I like them to be um, at either ISO 800 or obviously if in the low light conditions, 3200 or um, 6400. They're kind of the ones that I would go to. 3200 really is my favorite. And then I'll kind of go for like F1.4 if I have to, or F1.2, or uh, if I'm using the 50, f1.0 that's in particularly dark conditions or sometimes i just want to use the bokeh but um but yeah for me personally i would say iso 3200 is my kind of my go-to my favorite um let's see what else we've got here oh we've got uh oh this is a good follow-on do you use flash so um as i said in the video um yeah i definitely don't use flash at any point whether it's our weddings or the street or family work it's, it's a personal preference it's just how i feel about it um and i um feel for me that i like to show things kind of like the how the, the light tree was in the room show the atmosphere and how it felt and that's really the reason that I do it. And I've done it for years and years and years now. And, um, and I just really enjoy it. So even like um, in the dance floor, I, I won't use flash. So when it comes to like indoor um, Christmas activities, I most definitely won't. Not that I, that it can be absolutely beautifully done. And there's some incredible flash photographers out there, but just personally for me, I don't do it. Um, what else have we got here? Um, do you do any pose shots when doing family shots? Um, do I do any pose shots when doing family shoots? Um, I will if they ask me to and um, because I'm you know anything they want on the day then obviously that's absolutely fine I will do it not a problem uh, personally for me um, in terms of um, you know them booking me I would say that I would love them to, to book me on my documentary and to book me on the candid kind of like you know the, the real the raw photography but you know if if it does happen that um, that they want some kind of post images, then that's absolutely fine. You know, I look back at the images that were taken of my brothers and, and me and my family and my mom and dad, and, and I like them. I like seeing the big pose shot as well. So absolutely not a problem. I will do whatever they ask because at the end of the day, it's their shoot and I want them to have fun. Uh, what else have we got here? Do you prefer the Instax cameras or the Instax printer? <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> that's a tricky one. Um, well, I love them both. Uh, that's like trying to choose between your babies. Uh, so I love the Instax camera um, because obviously it's the nostalgic feel and you know, you can get the pictures instantly and you know, sometimes they go wrong, but sometimes that's really lovely because like the, the wrong can be, can be a, a nice kind of element to it. But there is something great. I've recently um, got the Instax printer um, I was just looking to see if I could find a print, a pay, a print. oh, they're, they're up there. Um, and I absolutely love the, the, the larger ones. They're really gorgeous. Um, and uh, I would say that it's really nice that you can print them from your, um, your phone or from your camera. So that's a really nice addition. Let's see what else we've got. Um, do you do much editing or do you get it right in camera each time? Um, do I do much editing? So, um, for weddings or the street, kind of, well, for weddings, I will use RAWs, I'll use the wraps of the Fujifilm. But for my family work um, and for any street, um, I will um, tend to use JPEGs because uh, they're so good on the Fujifilm cameras. And, you know, I don't really have time, you know, for any kind of my personal work, which is street and family, um, I, I won't, I don't really have time to go through them in that way. So I'll just shoot them and I'll usually shoot on like classic Chrome. And um, that's kind of the, the kind of the look that I'll go for. And um, it's kind of easy. But for my family professional work, I will use um, RAWs, I will use RAFs, uh, just so I have more kind of, um, I can play around with them more and it just gives me an extra one. So sometimes I'll have the RAWs and the JPEGs for my professional ones, or sometimes I just have the RAWs. I just like to give myself different options when it comes to, for the professional work. But for my own personal stuff, then I love the JPEGs. I love them, they're great. Um, how heavily processed are the shots not using flash? Oh, 
um, they're not really very processed at all. Um, we tend to keep things very, very simple with a very simple kind of um, a process to them. Nothing overly done. Uh, I like images that feel very kind of timeless. Um, and I don't like things that are too overly processed. So for me personally, I do tend to think about things of trying to keep the uh, the processing to the minimal. So um, I won't uh, I won't Photoshop them particularly. I won't do any if there's something I will tend to when I'm shooting try and shoot it right rather than um, Photoshop something out afterwards. Uh, so that's kind of like a big thing for me. And also like for family work and my own personal kind of Christmas things, I don't mind if there's a plastic bag in it. It's like, it's still part of the story. So absolutely, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me at all, you know? Um, and in terms of like my professional work, yeah, um, I, again, try and keep things very, very natural. Um, I've always been inspired by kind of like by uh, old movies, you know, like uh, the Hitchcock movies. And I love that kind of style of color. So I try and keep things in, in as much as possible is minimalistic, processing and just try and get it right in the camera. Uh, what about denoising in post-processing? Uh, personally, I don't use denoise. I, I like grain, um, always have. Um, I started out by shooting with um, film and I've, I embraced grain, I always have done. Um, and I don't think they look overly grainy personally to me. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't use denoising, although I have heard there's some really good ones around and um, if there was ever a situation, there's some fantastic software. Okay, let's see if there's any other. Um, do you have any tips for photographing animals? Uh, <laughs> how many tips for photographing? Well, a bit like children, get down to their level. Um, I love animals, I love children, um, and like I will, um, with the animals, I'll talk to them, I'll stroke to them, or I'll be with them, um, and I like to get close, very much I like to get close in with them, and just kind of, um, kind of get, show their true personalities, you know, I have, I have Paddington and, and Indiana, my two dogs in my life, and um, yeah, I like to, to really show their personality, whether like Paddington's an old dog now, and showing him kind of like, kind of looking up, but like, Adam, who's my nephew, you know, that, that kind of thing, um, or Indy, who's completely crazy, kind of like, I'd like to show that side of him with his tongue out. So I think just embrace the characters, whether it's people or children <laughs> or animals, just embrace their characters. Oh, another question. Uh, do you like using tripods to take pictures or are you handheld most of the time? Um, I am handheld all the time. Uh, I'm not sure I own a tripod. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, obviously some really beautiful things you can do, but personally for me, I like things to be very lightweight. I like to um, be able to move very easily. So I like to be able to move my feet. I'll be able to, so I, when I was talking about in the video about like a handshake's distance away, you know what I'm saying, what I was kind of talking about is sometimes I like to have my camera this far away, you know? And um, for that kind of kind of style, um, I, it's very difficult. A tripod makes you kind of static, I guess. And I like to move. So that's kind of really important to me for kind of like moving around. So um, personally, I don't use tripods, but um, obviously there's some beautiful work that does. Out of interest, what is your wedding camera setup? Good question. <laughs> um, so my wedding setup is very similar to um, my family and my street setup. Um, I use Fujifilm cameras. The only difference is for my wedding work, I use X-Pros um, and for my family and street work, I use X-E4. Um, I like to keep everything very minimal. I would say though, the X-E4 is my backup camera as well for weddings. It just has it in the bag as an extra. It's just really nice to have. Um, and I just love that camera. The X-E4 just goes everywhere with me. It's very light, it's very small and I can take it to, to houses, you know, I can take it to my family homes, I can take it anywhere, and it's just a nice thing to have. So for weddings, I use the uh, 23 and 56, uh, also the 50, 1.0, uh, and the 18, and for family work, I mainly use the 18 and the 50 with a little bit of 23 thrown in. Okay, what have we got here? 
How do you manage family members who don't want to be in the photographs, who aren't keen on being in front of the camera? That's a, I love that question. How do I, is it my family or is it, is it, is it a, a professional one? Um, so if it was either, to be fair, um, I would just smile, lots of eye contact, talk to them until they were comfortable and then start shooting, you know, just start shooting, not directing them, like say, hey, I'm not going to like ask you to pose or stay in a certain place. I'm just going to like be here with you guys and, um, and you're just going to have your day and we're going to have a great time and I'm just going to document it and I'm not just going to worry too much about it. And that's the kind of the thing that I would do. And I think if you kind of go with that, if some people can be really shy or, you know, the other flip side is if they are unwanting to be, if they're kind of unwilling to be in front of the camera, but they're still in the background, include them in the background, you know, layer them up, have some children playing in the, in the foreground. A lot of people will think that that's what you're focusing on, but actually you've layered it. So you've got, you've got all the adults in the background as well, and then they're in it. And when they see the images, they're like, oh, I'm really glad that I'm there. So just keep shooting, keep practicing, keep smiling. And that's the, would be the best advice for me for that. Um, uh, oh, she already asked another question. Uh, and have you ever had to manage dealing with self-confidence when taking photographs around family? Uh, so my own family, well, my brother Liam is a photographer, so we're, we're photographers together. Um, it's kind of a house. Um, my, my husband is a videographer. My uh, younger brother is a videographer. Um, my mom uh, is a keen hobbyist when it comes to um, shooting photography as well. So kind of a family of photography. So self-confidence. Um, have you managed dealing with self-confidence? No, I, I think um, you just need to understand that um, we're all people, you know, um, we're all together and everyone sometimes has moments of kind of insecurity and, in, you know, and that's, that's life. Um, and the most important thing is just to, to trust and to love and to be with the people and um, whether they're your family or whether, you know, you've been booked for a session, you know, just understand and be kind. And, and if you do that, then they will bring a positive energy and then, and then you will have confidence. So a kind of a thing is, I think, is just to get out there and do it. And that will bring the confidence. Um, and it just takes time. You know, I've been doing this for like 16 years. Um, and you know, I started a long time ago um, and, and my confidence is obviously built and built as you get better. And also like, it's the equipment as well. Like in terms of like, you get used to using them, you get used to, to taking the pictures. Um, and that's the thing, you know, you just need to practice and, and confidence will come. It just, you know, just trust in yourself, trust in what you want to shoot, trust in how you want to shoot trust in your family and all this, the, all this together combined will bring you your self-confidence. Any more questions? I don't think there's any more in there. Might be getting to the end of them guys. Has anyone got any more questions? Oh, how do you get so close to people? Uh, I smile and, uh, oh, hang on, there's more coming. No, I think they're all just the same one. Hang on a second. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how do I get so close to people? Uh, I smile and I, um, as I was saying before, in terms of like the hand movement, uh, it's, it's rather than getting my face close to people, I realize I'm gonna come off the other thing, I might be <laughs> off, the, off the screen, but I, get, I don't get my face close to people, I get my hand close. So it's like, it's a big difference, you know, by doing this, having your hand close than having your face close, you know, personal space, particularly at the moment. Um, it's very important to, to, to have that kind of level and then you can get actually very close to someone that way. And, and that way, and also smile, um, look people in the eye and be kind. And, and, and also you do have to judge when it comes to the street. I mean, I, I know you're talking about family and if it's your own family, you should know how close you can get to someone. But um, on the street or with uh, people you don't know, it's just important to kind of be able to look at someone and know how close you can get to someone. That's the other thing. So kind of like judge how you, how people are, because some people are totally cool being in that close and some people aren't. And um, so just kind of like judge that. And then also, yeah, the um, smile and eye contact. Um, oh, I think we might be getting to the end of the questions. Uh, he's put, and lastly, so. And lastly, how many brands do you own and which is your favorite and 
why thank you so much for answering oh, thank you um right uh i am um a fujifilm ambassador just to say that for sure but i love fujifilm cameras um and that's all i own <laughs> so i have had them for um a long long time um i have an xt1 <laughs> so i've started there my um and we have um, an x100 um v um we have the x pros we have the x pro 2s and free um, yeah, we love them. Um, and obviously we have the Instax line as well, which is, you know, it's just a personal thing, but I love playing with Instax cameras. I love doing that kind of like instant kind of work as well. And um, having something to to give to my family, um, particularly to my nephew, who's like free, to be able to give him an instant picture, it, like it blows his mind. Um, okay, and the last question, I think it'll have to be the last one. Um, is there any problem with you in being objective, looking for the shot and being fully present subjectively in the family situation? Does it cut you off in any way to have the camera? Is there any problem with you being, does it cut you off in any way to have the camera? Yeah, that is a really, really good question and um, a good one to end on because it is um, important to, to also be present, to not just, just be taking pictures because it's very easy to be always in photo mode and on Christmas day or around the Christmas celebrations first and foremost let's be with the people that we love let's be with them and then you know we've got the camera and if something happens let's take some pictures but yeah don't cut yourself off from the family the most important thing is to have fun at Christmas to enjoy it and then the camera can be an extension of that but don't ever cut yourself off from them that's really important to to just keep be keep having a great time and it is very easy as a photographer to sort of just think about the photography particularly you know like if you're um, a guest at a wedding and you're a wedding photographer and it's really <laughs> kind of switch that bit off in your brain you're gonna go oh no I'm gonna have just be a guest and it's the same uh, you know at Christmas with your family be family first and foremost and then take pictures and then you'll get the best pictures as well because you'll be having the best time and that will sh and they'll have the best time and then that will show in the pictures so I hope that was all really useful for everyone. If you have any more questions, then um, you can um, uh, message me on Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle is at York Place Studios. And I'm very happy to answer any of the questions or anything that um, you feel like you need to ask a little bit more about. That's absolutely fine. Or um, anything. So yeah, just um, that's, my, that's my Instagram handle. And um, just wanted to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And thank you very, very much for watching. Take care.